breaking out a, a classic here this morning. That's another word for an old one. The kids down at the rink when they come in and they ask for songs, they say, could you play something new? And I said, well, what do you mean by new? <clears throat> new? New is two weeks. New is two weeks. So when I'm playing songs that are, uh, you know, 80s, 90s, uh, 2000s, 2000s are kind of new for me, right? <clears throat> no. <laughs> Those are classics. Here's a classic for you today. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a rich like me I heard about his growing Of his precious blood's atonement a good classic, huh? The kids would call this a classic. I still think this is a new one. The one we're getting ready to sing. 
It's the song of the routine rising from the African plain. It's the song of the forgiven drowning out the atlas of the rain. Song of Asian believers filled with God's soul to fire. It's every tribe, every tongue, every nation, love song born of a full cry. All God's children sing in glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. All God's children sing in glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. Let it rise above the four winds, caught up in the heaven sand. From the towers of cathedral, faithful gathered underground. All the songs sung from the dawn of creation, some were meant to see. For the bells rung from a thousand steeples, not reached to earth. It's all God's children singing. can have a seat this morning. Man, you sound good. I was getting worried. You know, I talk about that song a lot. I can't wait to, to get back one day and sing that with some, some friends in India. There's a, a school that we go to over there. It's called Ebenezer School. There's like 1,200 kids, but they come from everywhere. They come from the Middle East. They come from China. They come from everywhere. And they all speak English, and they all have internet. And so a song like that, you'd get there and sing it, and they'll sing it with you. Mm. Can't wait to get back there and do that. It's an amazing place because you can be like a, a half a mile. It's, it's on a mountain. The school is on a mountain. Beautiful place. Three stories. You can't imagine how big it is. It's just a huge place. It's a residential school, so the kids not only come and learn there, but they live there. They move in. Big soccer field. What's that other game they play? It's kind of like baseball, Linda. What do they call it? Yeah, cricket. It's a terrible game. <laughs> terrible game. <laughs> I was watching one day, Mike, and I, I thought, you know, it looks like baseball to me. Let me let me get in there and take a shot at this. You don't swing the bat. You really don't swing. It was very humiliating. <laughs> These kids were looking at me like, who is that old guy trying to swing our bat? Yeah. Wasn't good. But talking about India, I was really concerned, and I'd expressed that a week ago here when we were at uh, practice on Saturday. Hadn't heard from Pastor Sam in quite a long time, and there are a lot of struggles going on in India. Their prime minister on that side, Prime Minister Modi, has said by 2030 he wants that to be a Hindu-only nation. And they are fighting like crazy with Christians, with Muslims, and making it very, very difficult for anything that doesn't have a Hindu label on it. And um, so I was worried about Sam, but I did get a hold of him on, was it Thursday or Friday of this week? Finally able to catch him on the phone. 
and surprised to, to hear uh, from Sam that, that God just doing great things in the middle of COVID, in the middle of all the crazy things on that time. They've got uh, three kids. The older one, oldest one is Jensen, and then there's Sharon. When we fir- first met Sharon, I think she was three or four years old. She was standing on the front steps of the church when we first came in, and she cried when she saw us. Anytime they had hosted missionaries from the United States, they made her mom cry because she would fix dinner for them and, and nobody wanted to eat with them. They said they were fasting, and then they'd go up to their room and they'd open up a suitcase. And the food's a little difficult on that side. I've got to be honest with you. It's a little tough, but they give you the best. But mama had been crying every time missionaries had come, uh, and we looked like more of those. But we, we developed a really sweet relationship with, uh, with the family and love, uh, we, we've learned to love for, for Indian food, and they, they try to make every accommodation for us when we're there. But uh, by the time we were leaving that first trip, we had uh, Sharon sitting in the back seat of the car with us, and she was playing patty cake games with Linda all the way to the airport, about a three-hour three drive. But it was, uh, it was really a sweet opportunity there to, to get to know some folks. But uh, Sam was telling me, the youngest boy, his name is Jabez, he, he, used to be, he was baby when we first went over. Jabez has never been a guy who likes school, like, at all. So whenever we came, it was his opportunity to, you know, take a day off because he got to kind of come see us. He wanted to say hello on the front side of the visit, and then he had to take another day off on the end of the visit so he could say goodbye. Never liked school. So I'm on the phone with Sam the other day. I said, how are the kids? And he's going through the list, telling me about Jabez, telling me about... Sharon and, and all the rest, and he says, he says, Stan, he said, Jabez, uh, he's in his second year of engineering, and I said, Jabez is doing engineering, and he started laughing on the other side, he says, this COVID thing has been great, because he got a second chance to take his exams, and they lowered the standard. <laughs> So Jabez came through, and he got into his second year of uh, engineering, and the teachers love him. They've taken an interest in him, and that's helping him with his studies. So they're having some good things going on the side. But, man, good to, uh, to be in touch with them the other day and know that God's just doing good things in their midst. I want to tell you, when, when we get in touch with, with folks on the other side, they are truly family. It's, it's like this just extended, you know? And uh, we've had Pastor Sam here a number of times. But folks all over the world today who are just calling on the name of the Lord, and and Pastor, you've said it over and over again since we started down this journey last year. God's going to use these times, guys. If it's like Jabez and lowering the standard, um, praise God for that. But I think most of all what God's doing is he's just drawing us back to his word, right? Getting closer to him. And that's where our help comes from. That's what this song says as we kick it off. Gonna lift our eyes to the Lord. Song goes like this. Our help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. Oh, we find all our hope in. Our soul, lover of every soul. Oh, he's our father and our friend. I will lift my eyes to the Lord. I will fall on my knees.
Lord, we thank you this morning that we can come and we can focus our thoughts, our attentions on you today. Thank you, Lord, we can take these moments that we're together and, and Lord, just put everything else aside, not worried about next week, not worried about last week, just these moments that we live. God, pray that you'll use them today. God, to bring us even closer to you. Thank you for your word, God. It tells us that if we'll draw close to you, that you'll draw near to us. So this morning, Lord, help us again just to put everything else aside. Spend these moments that we have drawing close to you. Prepare our hearts, God, for your word that we're going to share this morning. And, Lord, we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just sing one more. One more with us this morning. God, I'm on my knees again. God, I'm begging, please, again. I need you. Oh, I need you. Walking down this desert road, water for my thirsty soul. I need you. Oh, I need you. Your forgiveness, sweet, sweet holy on my ears. Sound of a symphony to my ears. Did man walk enslaved to sin? Won't know about being born again. I need you. Oh, I need you. So take me to the riverside. Take me under baptize. I need you. God, I need you. Your forgiveness. It's not sweet, sweet, holy, holy. Sound of a symphony to my ears Like holy one of my skin I don't want to abuse your grace God, I need it every day It's the only thing that ever real Makes me want to change I don't want to abuse your grace God, I need Every day is the only thing ever real makes me want to see your forgiveness. It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Sound of a symphony in my ears. It's like holy one, your forgiveness. It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Sound of a symphony in my ears Like holy water Okay, I hope you got a place to take notes today Coming in
We started going through the book of Romans the last couple, three weeks. We're going to continue in that. Dealing with stuff that tends to get ignored for any number of reasons among God's people today. And once again, as we're going through this, let me point this out. Books you need to understand to the best of your ability and just keep plugging away, plugging away. Romans, Hebrews, Galatians, because those are doctrinal foundational books that will make the gospel accounts make more sense, okay? Instead of just the earthly ministry of Christ, tie it all together. Why? What's going on? What is God doing in a bigger picture? And it will point us back to some foundational things that are starting to be lost. One is this. Today, it is very possible to attend a church for a long, long, long time and never hear anything said about repentance. And if you do, it basically is taught, just stop being bad and start being good. And that's not the idea at all of what Scripture teaches. One more time. Repentance, all capital letters, is a one-time encounter with God, the lost with holy God. And it only happens as you hear the gospel message that points out there is a loving God and whoever believes in him will not perish. He didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save the world. But those who believe not are condemned already by their own actions and unbelief. So there's got to be a way out of this. Ultimately, in laying that repentance out then, it is an encounter that changes your worldview. The word repentance means change of mind. It does not mean change of attitude. It does not mean change of action. It doesn't mean change of agenda or anything else you want to come up with. It means to have a change of mind. That is thinking, how you think. And at a a very basic level, the best way that I know how to describe that one-time repentance encounter with God is, I'm a sinner, and he's a holy God. I just now realize there is a God, and he is creator of everything and the giver of my life. And I realize that he is holy, and I am not. And his love for me exposes who I am as all of us are, sinners before God, unholy before God, because our agenda is all about us, our life, what I want to do, what I want to be when I grow up, and, and on and on. All of it spins off of that. Repentance in small letters is ongoing, and that is a bit of what God is doing through this pandemic. He is sorting through our thinking and he's calling us back to himself and his ways. Now, unfortunately, in too many parts of the body of Christ, and I'm almost using that term loosely, you're taught all about the favor of God, the blessing of God, the season of joy coming, the outpouring. But repentance is never talked about. Let's go back to what John the Baptist taught and Jesus Two words. What was their message? Repent and believe. He did not say, just start being a good person and then believe in God and then everything will work out somehow. It's a change of worldview. Now, here's what is clear to me in where we as a country have been most of my life, but it really got exposed lately that there are people who mean well, but they don't know how to do well because they don't know God. And in their mind then, they have been put over us to guide and lead and control. And what they end up doing is taking everybody off the cliff with themselves. What has happened then is what was exposed in the first chapter of Romans. These are people who know the truth there is a God. Now, they may not 
understand the salvation part, but they cannot, they cannot deny that. But they hold the truth in unrighteousness and do not allow anybody else to get in the door. The Pharisees did that, and we're still living that today. And so as we looked last week, of the institutions of our country, the remaining institution is the church. Guess what's going to become after, guess what they're going after next? They're already going after it. It's just we're not real good at complying. Once we understand that, this thing called repentance, then what we have done is we have exposed the reality that God is holy and we are not. All have sinned fall short of the glory of God. God will judge all men according to their deeds, and their deeds are summed up in this way. Jesus, yes, or Jesus, no. Belong to him or don't belong to him. That's what's going to sort people out, not your accomplishments, not the good you have done in this world, because believe me, I've got, I've got a lost older brother, and he's better than most Christians as far as his ability to work within the community and further the agenda of taking care of people. He'll be the first one to give you a shirt off of his back, but he does not know Jesus. And sad to say, we all have people like that in our families. Jesus is clear. He said, in that day, when I gather all the nations to myself and all people, there will be a group that will step forward very quickly, and they will raise their hand, say, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit those in prison? Did we not take care of the widow and the orphan? And his answer will be, depart from me. I never knew you. You workers of iniquity. Wow, did you just catch that? He didn't dispute any of the stuff they said they did. He just said they took credit for it. It was not because they knew Christ. So he doesn't dispute their what we would call worldly goodness. That's what, all, that's what so many of the things in this world are based upon. Uh, foundations and so on. They all have a cause. They all have a worthy cause. Well, I don't dispute that at all but they don't glorify God and they don't draw people to the cross of Jesus. So in that, they just end up being good works. The other group then will not say a word and Jesus will turn to them and say, come and inherit the place made for you. And then they will say, when did we cast out, anybody in this room cast out a demon? Don't raise your hand because we don't want to point out liars, okay? <laughs> Did we feed the hungry? I hope so. Did we do as good of a job as we can? Probably not. We've relegated it to the government and other stuff. Do we visit those in prison? A few do. Do we help widows and orphans? Sometimes. But that's not the issue of did you do. We will say, when did we do this and this? And he'll say, when you did this, any of this, to the least of these, you did it to me in your mind. That second group is only made up of those who have repented. They have had a change of world view. Before that, all of us, before Christ, we lived in darkness. When you hear the gospel and respond to it, he takes you from darkness into his light. Before Christ, all of us were living death. There truly are zombies in the world. They're all, all lost people are zombies. They go to work, they have families, they are neighbors, they're friends, but they don't know Christ. They are the living dead. They have never been spiritually reborn. Their spirit is born as we all are dead to Christ. As we have that worldview change, we are born again by the Spirit of God. He comes to live within us, not around us. He's not a concept. He's not the force. He's not a higher power. He's not any of that stuff. He is the true one and only living God who made all things, made us, holds all things in his hands. He is holy and just in all things, can never be disputed, can never be confounded, can never have his plans undone. And when we come to him, he begins to give us the mind of Christ. 
and he begins to give us the heart of a servant. We don't serve people because we get brownie points, okay? All the years that I was at Bonnie Dallas, and I'm waiting for it to open, I don't expect it to open for another year. But going down there for Bible study, I would get back in the mail all kinds of, the mayor is having uh, his uh, volunteer banquet down at so-and-so and wants to hand out awards, and I'm going, I don't know why I'd do any of that. It has nothing to do with it. Some people volunteer because it's a good thing to do, and I'm glad they do. But they don't do it as a believer. They don't do it to honor Christ. They just do it because they feel good and they are helping people. And, and what could be wrong with that? The only wrong with it is that Jesus doesn't get the credit for it. And therefore, if that's the mode of your living, all you're doing is trying to be a good person. And goodness has nothing to do with it. Now, having said all of that, that was the preview. Let's read through. You don't have all these verses on your sheet. That was on purpose because it's a whole page, okay? So I'll try to read as clear as I can. You try to listen as best you can. Romans 2, 12 through 29. For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, they didn't have the law of Moses, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness. Gosh, we talked about that in 9 o'clock Bible study, right? And their thoughts, the meanwhile, I love this part of the verse, accusing or excusing one another. That's a huge verse because I'm pretty good at excusing all kinds of stuff that I shouldn't excuse. Come to me, I'll give you an excuse, okay? Give me a pad of paper, I'll write you one. Does that stand before God? No. Our own conscience will either excuse, which we are all good at doing, or accuse us, and God judges accordingly. Either way, you lose. Okay? Either way. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel, last week in verse 1, it was God's gospel, the gospel of Christ, same thing. It's just that now Paul has incorporated it into his thinking. It's part of his life. That's why he calls it my gospel. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and, re, and resteth in the law, and makest the boast of God, and know his will, and approve the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and art, con and art confident that you yourself are a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of of the foolish, a teacher of babies, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Thou therefore which teaches another, do you not teach yourself? You that preaches a man should not steal, do you steal? You that say a man should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? And we know what Jesus said about it, just looking. Looking is it, so we're all guilty. If not, you need to take your pulse, okay? You that abhor idols, do you commit sacrilege? You that make a boast of the law through breaking the law, dishonor God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written. For circumcision, Josh, I hope you can hear this because this is part of the conversation we had in the foyer last week. Circumcision verily profiteth if you keep the law. But if you be a breaker of the law, your circumcision is made uncircumcision. It's a big statement. I can't go into it right now. Therefore, if the uncircumcision, in other words, the non-Jew, keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? Because he keeps the law. 
And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge you, who by the letter and circumcision you transgress the law? Here's the big statement. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of man, but of God. So Joshua is my comment to you last week. Stop worrying about Israel because the Israel of God is something quite different from the physical Israel of this world. And we've had that confused in the average believer because of the books and stuff that are out there, and yet this flies in the face of it. And I would much rather go with Romans chapter 2 than I would the latest book out on Amazon about faith because there's a lot of junk out there right now. Okay, that's a lot, and we could do this for four or five weeks easily. Let's try to condense it here. Good luck for me. Right back. Number one, there is a God-given internal law of conscience that everyone has. This is true in the prison system. Most of you know that I, back under Chuck Colson when all that started, came out of Watergate, uh, I was one of the very first groups with some other guys to go into the prison system doing ministry, prison ministry. And we did that in a federal level two that was run like a federal level one. That was the same prison that when the Santa Fe riots occurred several decades ago, they took the inmates here that survived the massacre and the governor declared that you can take state and put them in the federal, and that's where I was doing prison ministry. That group came down and joined us. And it's the same time when the Haitian boat people were all caught and rounded up, and they were sent to that same prison, and they just filled the hallways with metal bunk beds till they could figure out what to do with them. What I began to learn in prison ministry very quickly Several lessons. One is never take your wife to an all-male institute. Are you crazy or what? And that's what I did. And that was a big mistake. And I learned very quickly, thank goodness. But I also learned very quickly that inmates wanted to get brownie points from me because they attended Bible study and that might help them in their parole hearings and all this other stuff. And I, and I told them, I, first off, I don't give out brownie points. I can't. I'm not in a position. Uh, so just get get that out of your mind. And by the way, do not tell me why you are here because depending on your crime, I may never talk to you again, okay? Just don't tell me why you're here. And then we can have a relationship. I don't want to know about your sin. I'm dealing with my own, okay? Here's what I found. The prison system has a code too. And they know what's right and wrong. And woe unto you if you were a child molester federal system because you will be molested on a regular basis because that's crossing a line too far for most people. Murderers are much more accepted than child rapists. Why? Because of this. The internal law of God, conscience, says don't cross that line. Everybody knows that. Don't go there. And yet people cross that line. And there's a price to pay for it, right? So the point is this. First bullet here, Chris. Those sin in their lostness, those who, it should say who. Stick a who in there. Did that last week two or three times, huh? Those who, oh, I corrected there. I just didn't correct it on your sheet. Correct it on your sheet. Those who sin in their lostness, Without the law, will still perish in their lostness. There's not an excuse. You're not excused because you have a conscience. Everybody knows it. Your conscience will stand before God, and you can try to bargain, and you can try to blame. Remember that verse? It'll either accuse or blame. Either way, you lose. That's this. Romans 2.12, again. For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without law, and as many who have sinned in the law shall be judged the law. 
That's just how it works. If you didn't see the speeding sign and you still get pulled over, you will still be ticketed. Well, a few girls can bat their eyelashes and get away with it. My older daughter is one of them. But most of us, you know how fast you were going? And when they tell me 65 and a 35, do not make this your answer. Is that it? I thought I was going a lot faster than that. That would not be a good response to them. Just thank them for the ticket and go on about your way. Because you know that what you were doing was not right. You don't have to, it's not hard to figure out. Most people know the difference between right and wrong. They just don't quite exactly know what to do with it, so they just keep getting caught in their own trap. And they excuse or they accuse it's somebody else's fault. Well, it's my fault and I don't have any way out. And either you give up on your life or those around you give up on your life. It doesn't matter how you got there. That is the result of sin. The wages of sin is death. In this world spiritually, ultimately physically, and in the end, those who die without Christ have separated themselves from God because of their unbelief. And they will not be excused. It's not hearers of the law that are just before God, but doers. Second bullet. God's judgment, and this is the part that is hard now, God's judgment is fair because all have a conscience which will accuse self, take off the ING, or try to excuse not your own sin, but other people's sin. So you're going to have to figure out, all of us in this room have made some bad decisions in our life. We're going to probably keep making some more while we're still here on this earth. And one way or another, we will either try to excuse it or have somebody else excuse it, or it will accuse our conscience. And either way you cut it, God says, so you're guilty, right? Well, yeah. Those who are judged before God in their unbelief will not think that it's an unfair thing. Not initially. I think in eternity, yeah. Because they know that what God said is true. You know, in, in one of the crazy things in life, and it depends on what kind of personality you are, if you from an early, early age were hiding things and making up stories and not telling the truth, the odds are very high that you still do today. You just do it better. You just do it at a different level. And you always have a story for everything. If you want to really mess people up, just tell them the blunt truth because most people will think, well, that can't be right. That just sounds like you just made that up. Surely you can't be that dumb. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I can. When we stand before God, we don't need to accuse, excuse, or anything because he will already know if you belong to him. And it will be only because you have come to the cross. It will be only because you heard the good news of salvation. For God so loved the world, whoever believes, and you fit into that category. Now, he's not talking about religion. He's not talking about the things that religious people do. He's not talking about any of that. God knows my heart. God knows your heart. It doesn't matter that I don't even know my own heart, and it doesn't matter that I don't know your heart. God knows our individual hearts, and we will stand before him accordingly. Did I give you the second bullet yet? Oh, I turned the page. There we go. I've got to read it. When the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. So when we talked a few weeks ago about what about our friends in foreign countries and foreign lands who have never heard the gospel, is it fair for God to judge them? Yes, according to this. And by the way, they won't complain. Because they know in their context, in their culture, they also know right from wrong. And they will stand either excusing others or being accused or accusing self. That's the standard. God simply says, you reap what you sow, and you didn't sow the gospel, so you reap your own reward, and your own reward's not a good one. 
and they won't be able to say, but, 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 but God, they didn't, they didn't, nobody told me, nobody, no. God gave everybody a conscience, and they may not know yet the name of Jesus until they hear it, but they have in their heart, in their head, this built-in desire to worship, and they may, you know, they may call, they may call him the, the great God or the Father God or however they express it as lost people. But the fact is, in that culture, they are expressing the reality of a God without knowing who he is because they have not been told the truth of the gospel message. And we looked at that this morning in Acts chapter 14, Paul on Mars Hill. He said, I see you worship all these gods, but I see you also got a statue over here that doesn't have a name on it. So I'm going to tell you the name of that unknown God. And he is the God of all these others because these others are not really gods. They're just your idols. And out of that Mars Hill story, some believed, some didn't, some had to think about it. That's always the case. They show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, their thoughts uh, the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. We will be judged not by the angry Allah God, who is a God of vind uh, vind vindictiveness, yeah, vengeance, a mean God. There is no love in Muslim faith. There's just no love whatsoever. You do your best and you hope in the end you get a pass. But that's it. There's no assurance of it whatsoever. And so it becomes strictly a works-based philosophy and theology, and it doesn't end well. And yet, they still have this built-in desire to worship. So do we not have work to do? People need to hear who the real God is. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, who dwelt among us, the agent of all creation, by whom and for whom all things were made. Many Christian churchgoers who may not yet know Christ, they believe that as far as a statement, but they don't understand what they just said because that's revealed by God's Spirit within. Let's look at the second piece of this. The law was given to the Jews in history, historically, to reveal God. That was the purpose, verses 17 through 23. Here's what happened. Because God chose Abram, and he told Abram, I'm going to send you to a place that you don't know. So pack up, we're getting ready to go. And in that whole story of the calling of Abram, he never did ask, where are we going? He just left. Now, when it says Abram left, put it in the context. He had a wife, if not many more. He had kids, grandkids, aunts, uncles. He had a whole family. When he left at God's calling, it was a caravan of people. It wasn't just him. And so here go all of these tents and all of these camels and all of the servants and all of the stuff that he owned had to be packed up because he was a wealthy man, because God made him so. And yet he took off. And God said, I'll tell you when to stop. By faith, Abram entered into a land that he knew not, to a place where he had no idea where he was headed. Because faith in Christ is a risky venture because you don't know where it's going to take you. And yet God says, if you don't take a risk with me, you are at risk of being judged on your own. And so people of faith have to understand that faith is a risk. We walk by faith, not by sight. But I still have a calendar, and I still have a wish list, and I still have a to-do list. I still, have, I still plan stuff. But I don't know where it's going to go. How has COVID worked out for us? Is the two weeks up yet? And we know why it was two weeks, because that's what people will put up with. It was two weeks, two weeks, two 
two weeks, two weeks. Then it became the governor's weekly proclamation on Thursdays. And we did that forevermore. And then, and then, and then. Did it look like you thought it was going to be? No matter how many have died because of this, rightfully, wrongfully, wrongfully as a related death, which is usually not cause, it's just simply a, an added feature. Remember when this verse started and we couldn't, we couldn't be with our grandkids back for almost eight or nine months? No, a little bit shorter. When did we first? I remember the first time we had the kids over to our house. And as many are, typically of that age, millennial, they came over, they had their mask on, they looked at mom to see if they could come and hug us. Nope, can't do that, can't do that. Hunter came, and the rest, Vec is such a brilliant grandma because this is way after Easter. She had an Easter egg hunt waiting for months, and she just grabbed the littles and went, we're going to go hunt for eggs. They ditched mom just like that. Hunter is sitting there, and he, mom is left, so he doesn't know what to do. So he sits on the patio concrete. And I said, you can sit in the chair because it's all the same stuff. I mean, you know. And he thought about that reasoning, and he sat on the chair. And I guess it was at the end of the two-and-a-half-hour Easter egg hunt. Pretty soon, we were hugging the kids for the first time in months. They were scared to death because the world scares you to death. That's its intent. That's how you control people. You scare them. Is it real? Yes, it's real. Has it been mishandled? Yes, it's been mishandled. Has it been misunderstood? Yes. Are people, yeah. Anybody, any family here has not lost a loved one? When I lost my cousin, the first thing my daughter said is, Dad, Jeff died of COVID. And I said, no, he was obese for about 10 or 15 years. He has had multiple heart attacks, and he had a massive heart attack and got double pneumonia, and he died. And they tested his blood along the way, and what would you expect? So he died of COVID. No, he didn't. He died of obesity, heart failure, and congestive lungs. And some have truly died only of that disease. There's no way around that either, too. And it's real, and it's sad, and it's affected us all a number of you in this room that I know who you are, you've had this and you've gotten past it. And you were not in the church, getting other people contagious. Um, there's some become humorous stories in this, honestly. But we're all here today. And God is still growing us and working us and moving us forward. Here's what begins to happen to the Jewish people historically. God called them to be a people, and in them he called Isaac and Jacob, who was also known as, what was Jacob's other name? Israel. And how many children did he have? Twelve. And they became the twelve tribes. And so God chose one person in this world to put his plan in action for salvation that through the promise made to Abraham, all people might ultimately have the opportunity to be saved. And remember the story of the covenant of Abraham that God made? Now, here's how you did a covenant. And I know I'm chasing some details. Bear with me here, okay? You took the animal and you cut it in half, and you basically dug a shallow trough so the blood could run down. And you laid one half on this side, one half on this side, and the blood ran down, and then... If, if it's George and I doing a covenant, we would both walk through the blood to the other side, and when we both got to the other side, the covenant was done. I prefer just going to the title company and signing a gazillion pieces of paper for a title. That's how we do it. But here's what we need to know about that covenant made with Abram. God put Abraham to sleep, and he stayed asleep during the whole process. Only God walked through the blood. It is his promise. It is not a two-sided promise. It is only him who made the promise that I will make of you a nation 
of people from all over the world throughout all of time and history. And we find out the answer to who the heir was of all of this over in Galatians. God said to Abraham and his seed, I will make the promise. And he said, seed, not seeds as in many, but seed as in one, Jesus Christ is the seed. All who come to Jesus are the seed of Abraham, are the heirs of the promise, are the Israel of God. So Josh, this world Israel, you know, I'm, I'm a little more for them than the other guys in the sense that one tends to be the crazier kid on the block and the other tends to be the saner kid. But here's the fact. Lost people are lost people, and they all need Jesus. And we know the story of the Hamas leader. His son came to Christ in Jerusalem through a Bible study. And he lives in California today. And when dad dies, that thing is pretty well gone because the son has accepted Christ. And how many thousands upon thousands of lives have been spared because God saved one? It's not your heritage, it's not your lineage. It's not anything else. We have a few guys out there on TV proclaiming the Jews don't need the gospel. They're already saved. What a wrong statement that is, and the TV ought to go click and walk away from it. But that's what he teaches, San Antonio. Some of you know who I'm talking about. Let's correct some of that. First bullet, through the abuse and misunderstanding of the law, or maybe I should reverse that. Through the misunderstanding of the law that led to abuse of the law, maybe that would be a more correct statement. Israel was led into bondage by the letter of the law. The spirit of the law was rejected. And after Malachi was written, the last book of the Old Covenant, some 400 years passed before Christ came. And read Malachi. I think I suggested that last week. The indictment is upon the leadership of Israel because they were following the letter of and never knew the spirit of. They did the works, cast out demons, fed the poor, but they never knew God. They mishandled and abused the covenant because they assumed it was all about them. And so what happened is in that 400-year period, about 100 years before Christ came, the Jewish wars broke out against Rome. And that's where you get the book of Maccabees. If you have your Catholic Bible at home, you can open Maccabees and you can read it. And you can go to, to Josephus and you can see the wars. They, the Jews were in anti-Rome fighting mode when Jesus came into this earth. That's why uh, Judas Iscariot was basically a hit man. He carried his sword and knife with him all the time. He was, and he said, hey, just tell me who to take out and take him out. I'll just cut their throat and that's the end of it. Because he was a zealot who thought the solution to the Roman occupation was political. Am I starting to hit home yet? November 3rd and 4th and 5th and 6th. And <clears throat> Many believers today have misunderstood what's going on and they put their hopes in something they shouldn't have put their hopes in. Because politics is never the answer. It's just temporary. God causes nations to rise and fall. He brings leaders up and he puts them down. All of that. The economy is not the answer, although I like a good economy. I do. I, I, you know, I love not being hassled all the time politically. But none of those is the way out. And so if we start making that mistake, we're doing exactly what the Jews did. They didn't need God to have the law, and that's where the Pharisees came from and the Sadducees. They took the law and they started commenting on the law, and pretty soon they had a Sabbath day journey. Okay, If you're familiar with what I just said, you could only travel a certain amount during the Sabbath day unless you had in your pocket just kind of like a stake or a marker. And it was a boundary marker. So play the game for a second. I start here. I can go to here. And I ran out of my Sabbath day. So I pull a marker out. I stick it in the ground. And I start a new Sabbath day journey. Are you seeing what's happening here? And I got, I got buku stakes in my 
bag here. If I was told I can only go a half a mile, I got enough markers in my pockets to go 20 miles if I want to. And by the way, I'm doing the Lord's work. They just kept manipulating, maneuvering. Jesus called them on the widows and orphans fund because he said to them, you need to take care of your mom. That's your response. No, no, no. I gave to the take care of mom fund. I don't have to. Somebody else does. Is this not our nation? When my mom was in her assisted living for five years, couldn't speak anymore because of a severe stroke, the workers told our family over and over again, you guys are an exception to the rule. Most kids put their parents into an institution, and that's the last we hear. They pay the bill. They never visit because they've done their duty. They're paying the bills. That's what gets God mad when we take something good and abuse it and excuse ourselves or accuse somebody else. Through abuse and misunderstanding, they ultimately rejected the spirit of the law, the essence of the law. And God calls them out in Malachi. He says, I don't want your offerings. I don't want your sacrifices. I want you to love mercy, seek justice, walk humbly before your God. That's what I want you to do. Nothing else counts. It stinks. I don't want it. So how's your giving to God? Is it from the heart by the spirit? You're called a Jew. You retest it. And he calls him on it. He says, you got a double standard going. Let's look at the second bullet. Justification, being made right before God, is never through keeping of the law. Are you a Christian who still tries to keep the Levitical law? And I've had the, I know, I know some of you at least used to be, okay, if not still. And you're still, you know, I don't think I should eat pork chops and bacon and all that because we're not supposed to eat the unclean animal. Then give it to me. I'll eat it. I'll throw it in the pan. It's good. And Paul has that discussion. If you're a vegetarian and that's your conviction, fine, thank God for vegetables and eat your broccoli, okay? But if you like meat, thank God for meat and do that. But don't foul each other all up in this. Because we're free. Right now, we are being socially engineered as a country, big time more than in my life, and I don't know the outcome yet. I do know that a faithful God is going to stir his people up, that he's going to keep putting us to the test as to what things look like. So keeping the law will never justify you before God. Righteousness by faith, working by the love of God, for God so loved the world. And what is the greatest commandment? Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. What's the second like unto it? Love your neighbor as yourself. So how are you doing? Galatians 5. We're out of Romans for a second because I had to pull this piece of it. Here's the issue that I'm dealing with right now. And you can totally disagree with me on this. I don't care. I'm going to keep fighting the same argument. With my fellow pastors in town, it's very important in their life to go to pro-Israeli rallies. To me, it isn't. Sometimes a map is a lot more important. And they get mad at me. And I'm going, I want you to go back and find who Israel is. Because you're taking the people for a ride here. And they are with good intent and with good heart hearing what you're saying. But I'm telling you, the end of what you're doing is not in the Bible. So let's look at some of this. Remember, this is doctrinal out of Galatians. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you. Now, who was Paul? He was a Jew circumcised of the right tribe, they, they, da, da, all of that. He was the Jew of Jews. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was so gung-ho for God, he went out and killed Christians because they were opposing God with this new doctrine of this guy named Jesus the Christ. And he broke families up, and he, in, and he stuck them in jail, and he murdered many. And his name was Saul, and he was a religious, absolute zealot. And yet he did all of it in his lostness. So, my friends who support the now nation, 
I think they do it for the same reason. But I think it's misguided because they don't understand this right here. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Is that clear? Doesn't matter if you're a Jew. If you don't have Christ, it doesn't matter. Now, let me just ask the basic question. And Josh, this is a difficult answer because it involves not only the Jews, because they're not the only ones who live in Israel. Christians live in Israel. Palestinian Christians live in Israel. Arab Muslims live in Israel, on and on and on. Here's the question. Is Israel today a saved nation? No. Why? Because it's filled with lost people. Are there saved people who live there? Yes. Joe, that's the remnant. There's always a remnant. Now, where it goes from there, there's other questions I won't even bring up today because I'm still wrestling with them. Big time. Behold, I, Paul, say to you, if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, I, a Jew, speaking to the Jews, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. And the implication is, but you're all lawbreakers. I mean, you carry markers in your pocket so you can fudge on all of the stuff. And the Pharisee who stood and said, Thank God I'm a Pharisee. Thank you, God, that I'm a Pharisee. Thank God I'm not a woman. Thank God I'm not a Gentile stinking dog. Thank God I can come in the temple and I can give all of this wealth back to you. Yeah, that you stole from other people. And here's the sinner's prayer. There was a man across the way who dared not lift up his eyes to heaven, who dared not come close to the temple to worship God. He was scared of church. He would not enter in the building. And he simply bowed his head and beat his chest and cried, God, have mercy on me. That's the sinner's prayer. It's the only place I can find it in Scripture. So while we may give an invitation until God breaks a person and they get to that point where they are ashamed that God should even invite them to be a part of the body. They are scared to death that God will just zap them and they'll vaporize. They know they are lost and sinners. They just don't know what to do about it. So he did the only sensible thing he could do. He bowed his head and lay down on the ground and cried out to God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's repentance, all capital letters. And he was saved that day. And the Pharisee wasn't. The Pharisee was the one in church. The Pharisee's the one who was at the temple. The Pharisee's the giver. The Pharisee has the law. The Pharisee is thankful that he's not like all the other stinking people out there, right? If we ever start holding ourselves up above the people God is trying to save, we're in trouble. We talked a little bit about this last week. We tend to do missions this way. I'm standing above looking down on you poor people that need help. How about if we change that? We should strive for eye to eye. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. I've been saved by grace. How about you? And share with them hope. Otherwise, we're in, we're in trouble. Christ is become of no effect to you because of you are justified by the law. If you are, you have fallen from grace. Now, don't confuse that. That's over in Hebrews uh, chapter 7, too. If you fall from grace, he's saying this. The cross is God's gift of salvation. And if you come to the cross and turn away from the cross and turn back to the law, then you have done away with grace and you cannot be saved by keeping the law. Does that make sense? I hope I said that the right way. There are people who want to still try to help God with everything. They mean well, but God doesn't need your help. I don't know about you. When's the last time God asked for your opinion on anything? Not much. 
Christ has become of none effect to you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Folks, it's an issue of faith. That's it. And so how is God dealing with you in your life? Are you a person of faith or not? Have you thrown yourself at the foot of the cross and cried out for him to save you? He will. And cried out for him to love you. He already does. Why is this so hard? Well, because we all have pride. Right? For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith that works by love third piece. Who is a true Jew, spiritual Israel of God? Some of them live over in the nation of Israel. Most don't because the Israel of God is made up of all peoples, of all races, of all ethnicities, of all genders, of all points in time in history. All who have come to the cross of Jesus by faith are his Israel. Because Jesus is the elect, the anointed, the chosen of God. He is the seed of the promise of Abraham. And all who come to Christ become the seed of Abraham. So here's the question. And I'm not, this is rhetorical. Who here is Jewish? All of us would raise our hand if we know Christ. But if you're still confused in all of the last days madness and craziness and the misunderstanding of who Israel is, it's confusing to you. And that's what we're looking at today. So here's the question. Who is the spiritual Israel of God? Here's the answer. First bullet. All those who are born again by the Spirit of God through the cross of Jesus are Jews, Israel. Because Israel is not a place it's not a bloodline. God used a place and a bloodline. Abram, Isaac, Jacob, etc. He used all of that. But also, this is what I love in the genealogies. Through all the genealogies, there's always an oddball person in there. Like Ruth. Was she a Jewess? She was a Moabite. There's others in there, right? How about Rahab? She had a very uh, colorful life as a prostitute. And God saved her. And she's in the lineage. About Mary of Magdala, there is those who would say that she was also either saved from, I think the second is, some would say she was saved from being a prostitute. I don't think so. I think she was the woman who was possessed by devils. And God saved her. These are, these are people that don't fit. And yet they're part of the family because God saved them. By their faith, they were saved. They were made whole. Not only in when Jesus came did he heal them of their physical affliction, their emotional torment, their intellectual absolute confusion, but he saved their soul for eternity because they came to Jesus to be healed. And he did. Healing is not about physical stuff, because most of us, even when you get past one illness, guess what's coming next? Another illness. Not to get you overly excited, but after coronavirus 19, the year it came out, we'll have another one. And it might be coronavirus 20, 21, 22, 29, 30, we don't know. That's part of the dating when they come out. And it will do what all viruses do. It will keep mutating because God is the maker of life, and he's allowed that to, he uses that. He uses that throughout all of Scripture to send judgment, to get people's attention, to draw his people back to himself. And it's a horrendous thing to go through. Look at how goofed up we have been. Anybody not stressed out at all? If you're not, it's because you're on medication. I know because I resort to that every now and then so I can sleep. That or a hammer. One of the two. He is not, first bullet, sorry. Did I read that? He is not, a, yeah, I read that. Okay, second. The children of the promise are counted as the Israel of God. The promise came through Jesus. 
not as though the word of God had taken none effect, for they are not Israel, which are of Israel, neither because they are the seed of Abraham, he's talking about in the world, genetically through history, okay? Not because they are the seed of Abraham are they the children, but in Isaac thy seed shall be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. How much clearer can you be about what is going on in the geographic world today? But the children of the promise are counted as the seed. And that's all believers in Christ. Final bullet. I think I'm on the final bullet. Yep. All who come to Jesus are one in Christ. These are the spiritual Israel of God. Therefore, in Christ there is neither Jew or Gentile, male or or female, slave or free, all are made one in Christ. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God in all, one God in us all. And that's not Hinduism, by the way. Okay? It's that Christ can live in my heart by his spirit and still have 100% to give to you and 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 to you. And he never runs out. And his grace never runs out. No matter how much sin abounds, grace always superabounds, always overtakes it. The children of promise are counted as the Israel of God, and the promise came through Jesus. Third bullet, the last part. All who did I already read this one? I feel like deja vu is happening. Okay. Then, then let's read the verses. <laughs> Let me wipe my eyes first so I can see. For ye all are the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. That's it. Nobody else is his child. Only those who know Jesus Christ. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, he's not talking about baptism. He's talking about spiritual baptism. You are saved. You accept Christ. His spirit comes to live within you. Have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That ought to take off the double covenant discussion forevermore, but people won't read this, they won't study this, they just print another book out and sell it. And people who will not go through and study this and think through what it means and implies, by the way, it took me 30 years to get there, so it's a journey. You've got to kind of deprogram, George, before you can finally hear what God's word is saying. Those who have come to the cross are the Israel of God. As many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. One final thing, Josh, for you and many others sitting in this room, I think this is what goofs us up. I'm going to pull out a loaded verse, and I'm going to attempt to give a very short and to-the-point answer. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Where is Jerusalem? And I saw a city coming down from heaven, as it were adorned, a bride. That's the church. It's not a literal, okay? This is, this is showing us something bigger than we can imagine. The bride of Christ is his church. He's the groom, we're the bride. We are his Jerusalem. What does Jerusalem mean? Do you know? City of peace. We are his city set on a hill. We are his light set upon a hill. We are his city of peace. So let me change your thinking, perhaps. If you want to keep praying for global Israel in the Middle East, fine, because peace is a wreck over there and it's tentative at best. But here's what it's really asking us to do. Pray for peace among the church of God 
the Israel of God, his Jerusalem. Because right now, is it not fragmented as it has been for centuries with all kinds of crazy teaching and stuff? When's the last time you prayed that God's church would be at peace? We need to start doing it. Otherwise, we're going to start fighting each other. We already are. It's just, you know. Stan, you know what I do with that. I used to go round and round with Art on theology stuff because it was just fun to yank his chain. I just had a blast. It was, it was a good sport. And he would do the same thing. And I'd say, Art, that's okay that we disagree. God's still giving you time to repent. And he didn't know what to do with that the first time I did that to him. And ultimately, as we continue to study God's word, let's pray that God's body, his Jerusalem, his Israel, would be at peace with him and with one another so we can do the work of the gospel instead of all the fragmentation. Yep, and it wasn't of this world. Read Hebrews 11. Go home and read it. 11. I'm telling you, and I'm trying to get in that mode. I actually have joy in my heart, although it doesn't look like it a lot of times. God still has great days ahead, not because I'm pulling an Osteen on you. It's because he's God. Because he is God. I do not believe he's done with this country by a mile. Do I think it will be like it used to be? I hope not. Maybe it'll be something different. God is finished when he's finished. Your life is over when it's over. And all who have died during COVID have done so at the express will of God and permission of God, and he gave life and he took it back. And they will stand before him either as belonging to Christ or not. And some he took as children some as infants. Most people don't want to even talk about abortions. What's our number now? How many millions a year? And on and on and on. We need peace among, here, here's what I think where we stand among many other places. People are looking to make sense of what is going on and the only sense you're going to find is by coming to the cross. That's it. And until we invite people to come to the cross, to accept Christ and his love, and he puts them into the body of Christ wherever he chooses to place them, then we're just spinning our wheels wasting time. And it breaks my heart, even though I understand why they're doing it. My sister's church does this in the springs. You all wouldn't be sitting here today. George would be here. Chance would be here. Okay, you get the picture. You know that. And when you walk in the door, you have to bathe in the gasoline stuff. And you have to put on your mask, and you have to greet each other, but keep social distancing. I mean, hey, George, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? Hey, Sylvia, good to see you. No hugs in that church. No shaking hands in that church. Because they are bound. What's, what are we supposed to be, 25%? I know how to play numbers, too. How many can we seat in here? As many as we have to. Okay? If we're packed, it's because we can still hold three times more. We'll just use downstairs and next door and foyer. And we have to let God work through this mess we are in and get our eyes back to walk by faith, not by politics, not by economy. I love both of those, but they can also destroy your life. Not by whether you can go to the movies or not. Not by any of the other stuff because we are being sold a bill of goods. Something that is real has been perverted and twisted and is being held by those in power who know the truth, but they hold it in unrighteousness. And it is all about control. Let's somehow figure out how to walk in the power of God's spirit free, and you can still wear your mask. I've got two in my pocket. I don't know how old they are at this point. I don't know how many tire prints they have or footprints when I've dropped them on the Walmart parking lot. 
do what you have to do. Some of you are high risk. I'm high risk by age and by disease. So I'm not testing it because I know I can get sick. I'm not, I'm not trying to do that at all. You do, you know your history, you know your situation, you know your family. Pray for the Edwards family. They are still getting out of this. It's affected, it's, it's goofed them up. And in this whole thing, I still have all of Ed's tests. He said, God is good. While he was in the hospital, he still had his phone, so he would text. We'd text back and forth. So it's okay, pray. I'm good, I'm good. I'm the one, I'm good. Pray for my wife and kids. And then they swap places, and he comes home, and she goes in. And that's where some of us have been. And this will be our life for as long as we can do it. Okay, i got to stop there because now I'm just going to get off on right back. Okay, you know where this is going to go. Do what you have to do. Do what you should do. You know your situation. We've got to have grace in all that we do. And just let God work us through this thing. I, I don't know what it looks like going forward. I don't know. Let's pray. Father, we are in such a time of confusion as the body of Christ because we have allowed ourselves to, com to be confused with being a Christian and being a patriot. And while they may go together and should go together, they usually don't. So there's a lots of patriots in this country that don't know Christ. And that group can be a trigger point if we're not careful. Help us then who know Christ, who would also call ourselves a patriot to, to share the hope of the gospel. Not the hope of election, not the hope of economy, not the hope of the cabinet, not the hope of all the, uh, we're getting ready to go for a crazy ride. We already know that. What is new? Father, help us to turn our hearts to Jesus and Jesus alone. Help us to respect each other to the best of our ability, to understand each other to the best of our ability, to pray for one another, the peace within God's people, his church, for one another. Help us to do those things and keep our eyes upon Jesus because that's all that matters. In your name we pray. trouble finding this song. Maybe we start with a chorus. Keep me. I just lost this one, guys. Don't know where it went. You got this one? Lord, I hunger for your nearness, Lord, I wait. Hold me ever closer, Father, such a love I can't escape. Such a love. Key of A, that would make all the difference, would it? Try Key of A. Wow.
so draw me near, Lord. Never let me go closer to your heart. Draw me near, my Lord. Draw me near, my Lord. In your nearness, there. Closer to you. 